Kommen Sie her, schnell! Los, ich... Ah! Hallo und willkommen zu einer neuen Folge von Hard Historien. In diesem Video werde ich eine unverwechselbare Kopfbedeckung sprechen. Sie repräsentierte eine ganze Ära deutscher Geschichte, die geprägt ist von preußischer Herrschaft, Militarismus und der Bildung der deutschen Staats. Die Pickelhaube. The Pickelhaube, from the German Pickel, meaning point, and Haube, meaning bonnet, also sometimes known as a spiked helmet, is an enduring image of Imperial Germany, particularly used in propaganda from World War I. The typical Pickelhaube is a close-fitting helmet, usually made of leather, although there were some metal versions, with a decorative brass spike on top and a decorative plate on the front. Through Germany's military influence in the late 19th century, it spread to other countries, particularly in South America, where it continues to be used to this day. While it is no longer used in Germany since the overthrow of the Kaiser, it remains a potent image of the country in certain circles, particularly in English-speaking nations. So let us see why the German army decided to put a large spike on their heads for half a century. Pointed or conical helmets have been used by soldiers since antiquity, with examples appearing on Roman troops. They were popular in the Middle Ages, particularly in Northern Europe with the Vikings and Normans, as well as the Middle East with the Persians. Beyond any aesthetic consideration, the pointed shape had a, well, point. This design, often worn by foot soldiers rather than mounted knights, helped protect the head from sword attacks from above by deflecting and redirecting the blow to the side. In Europe, other styles eventually became popular, often including some sort of crest on top to serve a similar purpose. But the pointed design continued to be widespread in the Ottoman Empire and Persia. The Ottomans would wear what is called a turban helmet, which, as its name indicates, was meant to be worn at the center of a turban, with a point sticking out. The Persians, meanwhile, who wore what they called a kula hood, often added pikes on top that resembled spearheads. These were purely decorative, meant to intimidate the opponent and not to be used as a weapon, because, really, how desperate would you have to be to try and headbutt an armed opponent exposing the back of your neck. Through Ottoman and Persian influence, pointed and spiked helmets gained popularity through Muslim populations of Central Asia and Western India. Each culture developed its own twist on the concept, some with very tall spikes on tops, while others remained mostly cone-shaped. In Central Asia, the design spread, particularly with its adoption by the Mongols, and influenced the designs of the helmets of the Kievan Rus, the early precursors of the Russians, whose helmets also began to incorporate a small point at the top, which then became widespread as the Russians conquered most of Central Asia and came into contact with more helmets of this shape, and they adopted similar ones. They became part of the image of the Bogatyr, folkloric Russian heroes. These designs came and went, remaining popular in Persia and India, but eventually fading in Russia, where it was replaced with more European-looking headwear like tricorns or shakos. However, in the years following the Napoleonic Wars, a new sense of national pride took hold, and Tsar Nicholas I wanted to reform the look of his army to make it more distinctive. He supposedly created a new helmet based on an old one found by a Russian farm girl on the old battlefield of Lipetsk and said to have belonged to Yaroslav II, Sievolodovich, the Duke of Moscow in the 12th century. This new helmet was a leather dome with a large point on its summit, into which a plume could be fitted. The Russians did not use it for long, eventually opting for early peak caps, though the design resurfaced after the revolution with the pointed Budinovka, which was mentioned in the Yushanka video. So we've been talking about Persians and Russians, but this is a very stereotypically German hat. So you are probably wondering at this point, how did the Germans fit into all of this? But well, we're getting there. Similarly to Russia, Prussia was looking to replace its Napoleonic era shakos, which while imposing, were heavy, cumbersome, and didn't protect from blows or the elements very well, with something else. According to legend, King Frederick William IV of Prussia saw a model of the Russian helmet on Tsar Nicholas I's desk during a state visit, and, taking a liking to it, decided to imitate it. Whether that's what actually happened, or he just saw some troops or heard reports of it is unknown, however, but he strongly took to the design, and in 1842 ordered that foot troops of the Prussian army be equipped with it. This first model was fairly tall, between 34 and 36 centimeters, or about 15 inches, but otherwise resembled what we think of as a pickelhaube, made of leather with a large eagle on the front and a brass spike on the summit. 
Eventually it was found that this model, however, was too tall and unwieldy in the field. And in 1857 the design was altered to make it shorter and closer to the head. In the meantime, through Prussia's influence as the most powerful Germanic state, Germany not being yet unified, other principalities soon adopted their own Pickelhauben, simply adding different insignia, but generally following the Prussian model. For the next half century, changes to the Pickelhauben were fairly minimal and mostly aesthetic in nature, such as reducing its height slightly more, redesigning the base of the spike, the front plate, or the chin strap. The Pickelhauber gained great notoriety and spread further with the German victory over France in 1870 and the unification of Germany under the new German Empire. German military prestige soared and it began sending advisors to other countries to reform their militaries along the German model. The Pickelhauber being the standard headdress of the new empire, with only the independent minded Bavaria holding out until 1887, the style was spread to these Prussian influenced militaries notably in Scandinavia, where the Swedish and Norwegians adopted it, and especially in South America. South American countries had before followed a more French model, wearing kepis, as I stated in that video, but after the French defeat, armies in countries such as Peru, Colombia, Bolivia, and particularly Chile, all adopted German-style uniforms, including the Pickelhauber. In the beginning, they didn't even bother modifying them, wearing German imperial eagles on the front before eventually adding their own national symbols. Perhaps because of this German association and occasional rivalry, this is roughly the time the Russians abandoned theirs. At around the same time, helmets with spikes also became popular in the British Army, though in this case it is not through German influence but more of a common ancestry. The British model, known as the home service helmet, and usually made of felt covered cork, was influenced by British India, where sun helmets with spikes were worn. This is inherited from the Persian styles I mentioned earlier, which made their way to India. When the British picked it up, they spread the style to some of the other colonies, and some countries like the United States took the style and used it for dress uniforms. So these spiked helmets share the ancestor of the Pickelhauber, but are more of a case of parallel development, though the Pickelhauber's success probably helped with their popularity. Germany continued to wear the Pickelhauber through the end of the 19th century, but it started covering it with a cloth cover to make it less visible, and it was the standard German field headgear when the army went to fight in World War I. The distinctive hat became a staple of Allied propaganda against Germany, and was an often sought after trophy for troops to capture. But World War I also spelled the end of the Pickelhauber. A new kind of war, this conflict exposed its shortcomings. While the leather construction offered some protection against saber blows, it did not shield at all from shell fragments or shrapnel that became common in World War I. In trench warfare, the spike would also be conspicuous giving a soldier's position away long before he was high enough to peer over the edge. Initially, the spike was made removable in order to make the hat more discreet, and with leather shortages hitting Germany, ersatz versions made of cloth, thin metal, or even cardboard were issued. The shiny brass fittings were replaced in with dull colored ones to be less conspicuous. But as with the cloth caps of the Allies, head wounds still plagued troops, and in 1916 a steel helmet was issued, the Stahlhelm. The Pickelhauber continued to be worn behind the lines by conservative officers who were loath to part with such a distinctive and storied hat. But this ended in 1918 with the overthrow of the German Empire and the proclamation of the Weimar Republic. The Pickelhauber was seen as a symbol of the old regime and done away with permanently. Thus ended the story of the Pickelhauber, at least in Germany. While its country of origin abandoned it after World War I and never brought it back, perhaps because it carried too much militaristic baggage, especially today for post-World War II Germany, the Pickelhauber remains in use in the dress uniforms of several countries. The lifeguards of Sweden wear an all-metal version in, of it in their dress uniforms, as do military units of South American countries like Colombia, Bolivia, and Chile, who retain the Prussian influences I mentioned earlier. The British variant of the spiked helmet is also still worn by British army units such as the Blues and Royals, and ones influenced by the British are worn in countries like Thailand or Jordan. The Mongolian army still retains a dress version of the old medieval spiked helmets that inspired all of these. Additionally, it retains a strong cultural image, particularly if one wants to evoke Imperial Germany or an XP of it, like Baron Bomberst in Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. Cheap plastic versions have also been used as fanware painted in the German flag's colors at sporting events for German supporters. Additionally, sign language even uses a sign with a finger extended above the head evoking the spike on the helmet to say German. So the Pickelhauber remains firmly associated with Germany to this day. And while the German army no longer wears it, 
maybe they should reconsider. Don't you think the Bundeswehr would look awesome in something like this? So I hope once again you found this video interesting and will join me again soon for another hat. Until then, I tip my hat to you.